My name is Jordan Heath Rawlings. I'm on a mission to help Canadians navigate their finances. Join me on In This Economy as I help you understand the systems behind your money problems so you can finally start thriving even in these unpredictable times. Listen to In This Economy at the Frequency Podcast Network or wherever you get your podcasts. Find your frequency. You're listening to a Frequency Podcast Network production. Canada has long been one of the world's premier destinations for immigrants from, well, from everywhere. They come here for the quality of life, for diversity, for opportunity. They come for a chance, for a better future for themselves and their children. They come for the Canadian dream, if you want to be a little cheesy about it. But is that what they find when they get here? Today, we're presenting some of the work our colleagues at Omni News have done with Leger, a market researcher, to ask some questions to Canadian immigrants directly. What did they expect when they came to Canada, and what did they actually get? What is the Canadian dream to them, and how achievable is it, really? And if it isn't, well, why? And what do we need to do to fix that? Today, we'll take a look at expectations versus reality for new Canadians. And we'll get a view of life in this country right now that will feel very diverse and yet shockingly similar to everyone who lives here. I'm Jordan Heath-Rawlings. This is The Big Story. Rhea Santos is a journalist with Omni News Filipino, She worked on this project as many, many people at Omni News did. Hello, Rhea. Hi, Jordan. Good morning from Vancouver. And thank you for sharing your platform for Omni News. Well, of course, um, this this is quite an interesting approach to a survey and to what the Canadian dream means. So I'm looking forward to getting into it. The first thing I want to ask you, though, is just uh, explain a little bit about the methodology. Who did you survey and where are they from and, and who are we talking about today? So Leger donned this survey exclusively for Omni News, and this is the biggest online poll of immigrants of day to know how their lives are after they landed in Canada and if the pursuit of the so-called Canadian dream was worth it. There were 1,522 respondents from across Canada. We have representation from British Columbia, the territories, Alberta, Saskatchewan, Manitoba, the Atlantic provinces, Ontario, and Quebec. More than 600 of the respondents have been here from one to five years. More than 800 have lived here for six years and longer. These are just a view of of the profile of the respondents of this poll. But again, when you talk about immigrants, uh, these are fathers, mothers, children, families. Mm -hmm. These are dreamers who move from their origin countries to live permanently in Canada. And what were you really hoping to get at with this survey? What did you want to discover? Recently. The immigration minister, Mark Miller, set their immigration targets for the next years. Canada is seeking to welcome 1.5 million immigrants in the next two years. And as Canada prepares for the influx for more immigrants, Omni, through the help of Leger, want to understand if those who are already here feel they made the right choice. Was it all worth it? Is the Canadian dream, of course, depends on an immigrant's definition, attainable. The poll also wanted to find out the factors that are affecting their view of Canada. So we have racism, cost of living, lack of support, housing, infrastructure. Well, let's start then with the beginning of the journey. When you ask these people, why did they tell you they left their country and came to Canada? There are a number of reasons listed in the poll on why they moved to Canada. For women, the top reason why they came to Canada is for their families. For men, the top motivators are for financial and career opportunities. Aside from those, people move here for for freedom, social stability, and higher education. When you talk to them about the Canadian dream, as you've mentioned, what do they see it as? And I know, you know, you, you can give us some data on that, but you've also just, you've spoken to a number of immigrants to Canada. Tell me a little bit about what that means to them. The definition of the Canadian dream is different from each immigrant. 
based on the people I've talked to who entrusted their stories to, to Omni News. But according to the poll, one in five immigrants view the Canadian dream as a stable and having a good quality of life. Some view it as personal freedom. Job and opportunities also define the Canadian dream for others. People I've spoken with say Canada provides limitless opportunities and you can do whatever you want. You can, you can go wherever you want to go. For those who identify as BIPOC, Black people are more likely to say the Canadian dream means job opportunities and being successful. Latin Americans describe it as personal security, safety. And South Asians say future prospects for their children is what the Canadian dream is all about. A quarter though, Jordan, 27% cannot describe what the Canadian dream means to them. Hmm. With that, 8 in 10 feel safe in Canada. They are proud to live here. They feel they belong here and believe moving to Canada was the right choice. So does that mean... And, and you can correct me if I'm wrong here, but I'm, I'm curious, you know, when you ask them, first of all, the ones who have recently moved here, but perhaps more importantly, the ones who have been here for quite some time, do they feel that they've been able to achieve that, that, that they're living the Canadian dream? Based on our poll, more than 83% of immigrants say they are satisfied. They are happy with their decision to move to Canada. But our poll also says 58% are saying their Canadian dream is further out of reach. And one of the biggest struggles of immigrants, I guess of everyone, <laughs> is affordability. With 83% saying the cost of living crisis in Canada has made it more difficult to settle. For the people I've interviewed, they have to work multiple jobs to sustain their Canadian dream, to afford their mortgage, prepare for the arrival of their families to be able to send money back to their origin countries. Just to give you an idea, for the Filipino community in particular, this is something cultural. We call it remittance. We remit money. People send money back home as a gesture of love that I want you comfortable to. Because for some immigrants, a Canadian dream is not completely fulfilled if families left behind are struggling. Being in Canada for them in itself is a dream fulfilled. And then as, as they start their lives, you dream more for yourself and your families. And to be able to live that dream, to be comfortable, to be worry-free, these immigrants I've talked to have to work multiple jobs, some of them getting sleepless nights. And Jordan, if I may, if I may share, there's this one clip that really stuck to me, and it's really striking. It's a soundbite of one of my interviewees saying, I've, I've slept, uh, because I told them, I asked them, is sleep? still in your vocabulary. Hmm. And, and she said, you know what? I've slept a lot when I was little. Time is so precious. We got to work now because eventually we'll sleep forever. Right. It's sad. It's funny, but it's, it's sad. Also, I had the, the opportunity to talk to the executive director, by the way, of the Canadian Center of Caregiving Excellence. They're a group based in Ontario. And a lot of care providers are immigrant women who have been struggling with, with supports when it comes to pay, their immigration status. Mm -hmm. A lot of these essential workers have been taking care of Canada's aging population for years. And yet the organization said these care providers are not being rewarded and seem to be forgotten even after their value was highlighted during COVID. So for this particular sector, the care providers... They are still waiting for their Canadian dream to be fulfilled. So really lots of work to do in all branches of government to address the concerns. I mean, as you mentioned, affordability is not uh, strictly at all an immigrant concern. I mean, you're worried about it. I'm worried about it. Everybody listening uh, has felt it. When you talk to people who are working uh, those many jobs or when you survey them and you ask them, you know, if you're not achieving the dream you came to Canada for, what's in the way of it? Is that what they cite? And and how does that vary across populations or locations or anything like that? Or is this, this is just the universal uh, state of Canada now? You and I both agree affordability is one of the greatest struggles of everyone, not only immigrants. And not being able to afford and or keep up has to do something with the existence of systemic barriers for immigrants in particular. I've spoken to a professor of economics at the University of Fraser Valley. His name is Michael Batu and an immigration lawyer, Lou Dangzalan, who both gave their thoughts on building a life here for immigrants. 
And according to them, immigrants have long faced systemic barriers. One of these is the challenge on credential recognition, where in your experience, education in a certain skill or profession are not recognized when they land here. Therefore, most immigrants land in low-paying jobs. Their skills that Canada actually needs are wasted or underutilized. During COVID, if I may share, I remember doing stories about immigrant doctors who are not yet certified in Canada, but due to the shortage, to the vast need for doctors and nurses, they were ready to get on board, but they weren't able to help. So we have an army of immigrant physicians and nurses who cannot help in addressing the healthcare crisis during that time. But you see, a lot has changed already. We have to acknowledge that. But underemployment is a big problem for a lot of immigrants. They could have been working working in a field where they have been trained for all their lives, but are not when they get here. They should have started fulfilling their Canadian dream but are not because of time, costs, and challenges. So aside from credential recognition, the the experts or the economics professor also mentioned about the existence of Catch-22 or the requirement for Canadian experience when employers are hiring. Then there's discrimination. The economist also mentioned a very important study done by the UBC years back, wherein those with Chinese, Pakistani-sounding names, South Asian names, especially Muslim names, do not get a fair chance to be hired. And our poll actually reflects that. The Canadian dream seems furthest out of reach for Arabs and South Asians. Arab immigrants express some regret moving here. Hmm. One challenge also in, in building a life here, seven in ten or 71% agree that Canada has not thought through a strategy on how to settle the immigrants it brings in. More than half saying there is not enough housing to support the influx of immigrants. So yes, we have 8 in 10 feeling safe and proud to live here, but only half agree that Canada has enough jobs to support immigrants. Are all these things, uh, especially affordability and and jobs and that kind of stuff, are they similar all across the country or are there some provinces or territories where recent immigrants report that they feel there is more opportunity than elsewhere? When we look at the results from Quebec, those who have settled in Quebec feel happier with their move to Canada compared to those from the rest of the country. So 87% of Quebec immigrants agree moving there was the right choice. A big percentage agree there are enough jobs to support immigrants. If you are to compare Quebec from the rest of the country, 49% in Quebec agree their Canadian dream is further out of reach compared to 59% shown from the rest of the country. Their household struggling stands at 34% versus 43% in the rest of Canada. There is a Leger study done August 2023 that revealed 47% of Canadians say they are living paycheck to paycheck, but this sentiment was lowest in Quebec. The potential reason for this may be related to the idea that the impact of inflation and rising costs has been lower in Quebec compared to the rest of the country. When you look at the problems that immigrants are facing, adapting to Canada when they get here, problems with credentials, as you mentioned, What is being done either on a national or a provincial level to, I mean, first of all, make life uh, easier and more affordable for newcomers, but also to make sure that Canada gets to take advantage of all the skills uh, that they bring to this country? We've reported on grocery rebates, CBA loans for small businesses. Immigrants are saying some of those introduced by the government are Band-Aid solutions. But I think this question is best answered by those in authority who can offer programs to support newcomers. But based on my exchanges with immigrants I interviewed, there are sacrifices needed to be made to keep up with affordability, as simple as eating cup noodles instead of going out for ramen, going to a park instead of attending the Calgary Stampede or going to the p in the story that I did, it's working multiple jobs to the point of not getting enough sleep to earn more. Mm-hmm. They all agree that life in Canada is expensive, with housing rent taking much of their paycheck. And the only way to keep up our financial sacrifices and finding more sources of income. And just to add a very important topic, financial literacy is important for immigrants, especially for newcomers. Many end up in huge amounts of debt because of credit card loans, because at times... 
that's the only way to survive for them. You mentioned earlier some of the sort of subtler uh, methods of discrimination in terms of names on a resume or that kind of stuff. I'm curious about new immigrants and older immigrants experience with more overt racism in Canada. It's certainly something we've talked about on this show that we like to think we're better than that. The reality on the ground may tell a different story. What are they reporting? According to the polls, six in 10 immigrants have experienced or witnessed racism or discrimination around them. The most common discrimination is about race, followed by language. Respondents also reported religious discrimination, especially for Eastern Canadians in Ontario. 14% have been discriminated because of how they dress. Among the BIPOC community, Latin Americans, Black people, and Chinese immigrants are most likely to have experienced racism or discrimination personally. And more than 80% are saying discrimination came from outside their community. While Filipinos and South Asians rank high on experiencing discrimination within their own community. What does that look like? You know what? I am of Filipino heritage. That is my community. Based on my observation, it's discrimination that springs from social class. I'm curious, and it might just be the reasons that you've already cited, but I'm curious about the 17% who do regret coming to Canada and why they say they regret that. Is it just the cost of living or what is it? I mean, obviously, they took a huge risk coming to this country. It's great to know that... Despite affordability problems, Canada, it feels like Canada's paying off for a lot of them. But I'm curious about the people who legit regret coming here. Like, for example, in the case of like the Muslim community, they suffer more when it comes to discrimination. Mm -hmm. But, you know, as I've said, when when immigrants come here, they're nothing can stand their way. They feel somewhat regretful, but they will still choose to stay. Although I've done stories of Filipinos, a few who have decided to come home or to go home, to go back to the Philippines. And why do they make that decision? I know we're not talking about the data here. We're talking anecdotally, but but I'm curious. Yeah, because they can't afford living here. It's just too much. They, They come to Canada with debts, and then they find out that Canada is also suffering from affordability, that, you know, rent is finding a place to to live is hard to find. The rent will take up a lot of your paycheck. Most of those who feel regret, the ones I've talked to, are international students. Right. Because that's the most expensive route to get to Canada, but it's the fastest. And you know how tuition fees are here in Canada? It's thrice, four times the tuition fee of, of a local, of a domestic student. And aside from that, of course, the policy of Canada for international students is they just get to work for 20 hours a week. That's their max. And imagine working 20 hours with, what, um, minimum wage? I'm sure they're, they're in jobs where it pays just minimum wage. They really can't afford staying in Canada. That's why a lot of students get cash jobs, under the table jobs, wherein they're paid directly cash. They don't need to declare it to the government. But there's a policy, an immigration policy that is about to end that covers international students. And that policy will end this December 2023. And the ones I talked to, they want it extended. This policy is allowing international students to work full time. So they study full time. They work full time. I don't know how they do it, Mm. but they're doing it. Yeah. Actually, these students are appealing to the government if they can extend that policy when the new year comes because Canada is suffering from an affordability crisis. Well, this is the last thing that I was going to ask you, and, and you just kind of hinted at it there, is, is when you talk to these immigrants or when you, you look at the survey results, as you mentioned, Canada has huge immigration targets uh, over the next few years. What do they want to see in terms of Uh, changes to the immigration system or tweaks to the supports that would help the next wave of new Canadians adapt and achieve what they've achieved? Yeah, let me just share this information that we got from our poll. Immigrants who agreed that the right supports were in place to help them when they landed in Canada are far more likely to disagree that the Canadian dream is out of reach. So this line emphasizes the importance of settlement or newcomer organizations. When an immigrant sees someone who looks like him or can speak her language, 
It makes it easier for newcomers to navigate the system. It is crucial for them to feel welcome, integrated, and successful. So this changes the overall experience of immigrants if they're support when they land here. But more importantly, we talked about this a while ago, systemic barriers or policies in place that hinder immigrants from, pers- from pursuing their Canadian dream should be addressed. We talked about credential recognition. It has been a long time issue in Canada. But in BC, the International Credentials Recognitions Act has been passed and will take effect summer of 2024. So the act would monitor 18 regulatory bodies of 29 professions to make changes to expedite credential recognition. No details yet on how this will proceed, but this is a move in the right direction. One big change also, we mentioned it a while ago, the removal of the requirement for Canadian experience in the hiring process. Ontario just recently is set to introduce legislation that would ban the Canadian experience requirement and job postings. And if passed, this would make Ontario the first province in Canada to help more internationally educated immigrants work in fields that they are trained for. So with these provinces' progress on credential recognition and Canadian experience, the hope is other provinces will do the same. And um, it was also mentioned in my interviews with experts that if Canada can find ways to certify future immigrants in their home countries, it will be better for the immigrant and would be best for Canada. So when they get here, they are already job ready. There's also a call to expedite the immigration process. So, of course, families can be together and the immigrants' well-being can be taken care of. Because if family is around, the more productive an immigrant will be. So really lots of work to do on the side of the feds, provinces, and the bodies regulating certain professions. Mm -hmm. I believe, I feel there's not one solution. Uh, We all have to help each other, even the media. We have to continue amplifying the voices of immigrant communities so that they are seen and heard. And hopefully their needs can be addressed because they are an important part of, of Canada. Because I'm an immigrant myself. I came here 2019 as an international student and maybe just a change of mindset to my fellow immigrants. Immigrants are here for a reason. As much as we want to be here, Canada needs you, needs us too. So let's keep our head high and put value on what we're bringing into our new home. Let's recognize and respect that we are on borrowed land. Let's be thankful. Let's take care of it and let's all be productive. Thank you so much for that. And thanks again for uh, walking us through this report. Jordan, thank you very much. Rhea Santos of Omni News Filipino. That was The Big Story. For more from us, you can head to thebigstorypodcast.ca. For more on this report, you can tune into City News or go to Omni News online or on your television set. And you can hear Rhea tell some of the stories she told us today in depth. If you want to talk to us about this episode or any other, you can find us on Twitter at the Big Story FPN. You can write to us. The email address is hello at the Big Story Podcast.ca. And you can phone us and leave a voicemail. The number is 416 935 5935. Thanks for listening. I'm Jordan Heath Rawlings. We'll talk tomorrow. <laughs>